Thank you, Louise and Jay, for um, managing to get the funding to bring me over. I did my PhD here in New Zealand, and it's wonderful to be able to, to be back. Um, so kia ora, everyone. Um, and uh, I found it interesting that Louise mentioned that if you Google me, if you Google me, you'll find the reason why I'm interested in this particular topic. Because the second thing you will Google is, uh, th that will come up on, on a Google search, is um, some rants from people who were very incensed by some research that I did about um, flags on cars for Australia Day, um, finding a correlation, as an association between people who fly flags on their cars in a nationalist sort of way and racist attitudes. Um, and what surprised me about the results of those, that research was that people didn't like the use of the word racist that they did not understand what we as academics have been um, talking about for the last 30 plus years, which is a notion of the new racism as opposed to traditional or old racism or biological racism. So um, I guess it has prompted me to be a bit more circumspect about the way in which I use the term racist. Um, and also to try to, to kind of make, make more of a public deal about what, what do we mean by, by racism. And I noticed that this is an issue here in New Zealand as well. So since I've been here, um, I've been told about, about a number of different sort of instances in the, in the media lately. I mean, I, I, I find it interesting that living, when we were living in New Zealand, that people always would say, ah, but we're not as racist as Australians. And that's kind of the, kind of the measure. It's a pretty low bar, I must admit. Um, and, and whenever tradespeople would come over, they would, look, looking at me as, uh, you know, I, I appear to be right, white. I'm actually kind of half Indian, but... but because I look kind of white enough, they would assume that therefore it was okay for them to say very racist things to me about uh, Maori, about Pacific Islanders, um, and about other migrants to Australia, uh, to New Zealand. So I, I find it interesting that New Zealanders kind of pride themselves on on not being as um, as racist. Um, there have been uh, there's been discussion in New Zealand around the idea of casual racism and whether the term casual is the appropriate term. In Australia, we kind of use the the term everyday racism, and certainly there appears to have been an increase in the numbers of racist attacks. You know, everyday racist attacks on um, on public transport, for example. Certainly since the, uh, the Brexit in the UK, it's been very clear that uh, people have felt empowered to enact everyday racism um, in, on, on the street, on public transport and, and so on. So we're sort of seeing a rise of this. Um, and I know that your Human Rights Commissioner um, has, has warned New Zealanders about becoming complacent about casual or everyday, uh, everyday racism. Um, I also became aware that the New Plymouth Mayor stood down from his um, job recently because he called himself a um, recovering racist, which I think is a very kind of um, a, a bold thing to say, that sort of recognising that as P a Pākehā that he was inherently racist, um, but that he was trying to kind of be aware of, of his own his own racism. Um, and the reason he has been criticised was because he was making an argument that democracy wasn't actually working for Māori, that Māori were still marginalised and were in fact being marginalised by democratic processes because of the um, tyranny of the majority, basically. And so he was arguing for dedicated places for Māori on, um, on local government, lo local councils, etc. And he had heaps of hate mail as a result of some of his, um, his strategies and some of his statements. And in fact, he, he even had somebody dressed in a Nazi uniform apparently come uh, to his office. So um, these are interesting instances of the ways in which race and racism and accusations of racism make themselves felt in, um, in everyday lives uh, within the New Zealand context. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is, is pretty much focused on the Australian context, but I think that you will see a lot of parallels in um, in New Zealand. Um, certainly in Australia, um, a lot of the conversations that we have around issues of race and immigration particularly are anti-Muslim conversations. They're also anti-Asian conversations. Even though Asians are kind of okay as far as immigrants are concerned, in Australia we're very concerned about um, Asians, Chinese buying up real estate and buying up farmland and so on. And I understand this is also an issue here. So there are all these parallels between, uh, between Australia and New Zealand. Zealand. Recently I reviewed um, an article from New Zealand, which, and hopefully there's nobody in the room who actually wrote, wrote the article, um, but it was looking at the, um, 
instances of microaggression uh, by police against, um, against uh, people of migrant backgrounds, people of black, black African uh, refugee backgrounds particularly. This is also an issue in, in the Australian context. So there's lots of, lots of overlaps. All right, so um, what have we got? Uh, the, the plan for the, the presentation is uh, discussing old re rolled racism and new racism, looking at kind of some of the overlaps between them. An emphasis on the new ra racism as discursive, as something which is talked about, which is, um, I guess, a, a spread of an ideological position, which is done through discussion, through conversation, in everyday conversation. The relationship between nationalism and the new racism, um, and using a number of examples, both quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative uh, work tends to get more press, and the Flags on Cars study was a case in point. Um, it makes very clear the relationship that we're interested in, which is the relationship between nationalism and, and racism. But qualitative research, where we're investigating in detail the ways in which people are talking about these issues, that gives us a much more nuanced and a deeper sort of understanding of how racism is um, generated and perpetuated. And then I want to end with a few examples of challenging racism, how to challenge racism. So what do we mean by um, the old racism? Well, the old racism is basically racism um, which is based in, uh, in biological definitions of racial difference. So biological uh, definitions of race have been around for, um, for centuries. Um, basically, the assumptions that um, characteristics are genetically or biologically um, determined, that physical features such as skin color, hair type, um, shape of face, um, shape and colour of the eye, phenotypical features, um, that these differ between groups of people and that they are related to other characteristics such as IQ, such as um, uh, attitudes, such as um, uh, personal characteristics, moral characteristics, etc. Um, now, since the 1950s, we've recognised that this notion of race um, is a social construction, and UNESCO made a statement, and I, I won't read it out, but uh, it's up there for you to read, um, denying that race has any kind of real basis and that it is actually a social construction. Um, and a few years ago, an academic from Macquarie University, a law lecturer, um, sparked a controversy in Australia by publicly declaring that Australia was becoming a colony of the third world and that migration of non-whites should be banned. Um, this sort of argument has been taken up by some, some of the far-right political groups. Um, in a letter to the editor, he said that migration from Africa would increase the crime rate, violence, and a range of social problems in Australia, and that Asians were taking over as a managerial, professional, ruling class. So you can't win, you're, um, it's so, yeah, if, if, if you're not a white Australian. Um, his comments were prompted by seeing photographs in a local newspaper of happy African refugees, and happy is his quote, happy African refugees becoming Australian citizens. He based his arguments on a belief that cognitive, that is intellectual and physical abilities and emotionality vary according to biologically determined racial differences. So that, that's the, the traditional, so I'm giving this as an example of traditional or old uh, racism. He argued Australia needed to retain its distinctive Anglo-Celtic identity by keeping out those who are racially and culturally different. Um, his views had a lot of popular support. One of the polls put it at 85% of the population agreeing uh, with those attitudes. So in this con controversy, we see many of the common themes encountered when thinking about race, um, ethnicity and nationality. Um, we see the workings of a discursive formation about racial superiority. Whites are better than blacks, both migrant blacks and indigenous blacks, and therefore ought to remain at the top of a racial hierarchy. The connection between um, race and morality. Whites naturally have a superior emotional uh, control and an understanding of right and wrong compared to blacks and others. And the notion of racial threats, that if whites um, do not protect themselves by excluding others, their very existence will be threatened. And there's a lot of research now developing in New Zealand about how this discourse of threat is uh, becoming, um, becoming more common here as well. Fraser, did the, the, um, the scholar um, I've been talking about, did not have to spell out these ideas in detail. He was able to rely on implicit stereotyped assumptions shared by his predominantly white Australian um, audience, a discursive formation about race which has its roots in centuries of thinking and talking about the context. So despite the UNESCO declaration back in the 1950s, we still have um, these sorts of assumptions um, out there. 
So as I've mentioned, these are examples of the old racism. The old racism um, assumes there is an essential biological inferiority of certain groups um, and therefore has a desire for social distance between uh, the races. Um, it's very negative about, um, about miscegenation, about mixing of the races, um, uh, so even marriages and, and uh, the generation of, of mixed race children. And it's related to the emotion of disgust. Okay, so it's, it's, it's an aversion. Um, the definition of racism from Bulmer and Sol Solomos combines both traditional racism and the new racism. So they say it's an ideology of racial domination based on beliefs that a designated racial group is either biologically or culturally, and that's the new racism, which we're going to talk about shortly, inferior, and the use of such beliefs to rationalise or prescribe uh, the racial group's treatment in society. Now, there's also an acknowledgement that we have structural racism as well, but I'm not really going to talk much today about structural racism because I'm interested in the ways in which racism is perpetuated in our everyday lives rather than in social structures. But that last uh, dot point um, recognises that, that um, there are structures that maintain um, inequality as well. So what is the new racism? Basically, the new racism, as I've mentioned, is based on the idea of uh, a cultural hierarchy where certain cultures are seen as kind of more deserving, more advanced, um, as, as, as greater morally than other cultures. Um, it's less about biological uh, assumptions of superiority and inferior inferiority. And um, so new racism maintains practices that exclude certain minority groups on that basis, the basis of cultural hierarchies, whether these groups are racially different or not. So it allows us to discriminate and to make prejudicial comments based on religion, for example, or nationality as well as race. And the arguments are generally around the idea of incompatibility, that given that there's a racial hierarchy, that some of these groups simply cannot and do not um, mix it, that they are incompatible. It is ostensibly colorblind, and often you will get, um, as the next slide shows, a denial of that this is racism. It's simply recognising differences um, and acknowledging that those differences exist. Um, and it, rather, than, um, the, um, rather than being related to the emotion of disgust, it's related to the, and this is psych, psych research has shown, it's related to the emotion of resentment and of anger. And we'll see some examples of, of those. So this is just an example from, um, from my PhD research. Granted, it's quite old. But it's an example, I think, of traditional racism, the old racism. So you've, th this, is, this is a, a couple that I interviewed, um, and Anne, the wife, says, oh, I don't know. And she's, she's, kind of, she's doing a lot of hedging. She's very careful about what she's saying. Maybe it's my ignorance, but uh, oh, I don't know. It's probably not the right thing to say. But if the English didn't come here to New Zealand, where would we be? And Ken says, we'd be running around in grass skirts. That's what I think. Uh, not necessarily, she, she doesn't want to overstate things, but where would the country be? So she frames it as a rhetorical question where the audience fills in the gap, basically. We'd be like a third world country, um, says Ken. Now, an interesting feature of, of this couple is that Ken is Maori. So, so here we have kind of racism being enacted, being voiced, um, kind of with, within a population. Um, Okay, so uh, a bit of a, a, a focus on the new racism as discursive. Um, as I've mentioned, um, ideas circulate in the world as utterances. This is a, a quote from John Thompson. Um, as expressions, uh, as words which are spoken or um, inscribed. Um, so racism is communicated, and I'm interested in the communication of uh, racism. One of the key uh, writers in this area is Margie Wetherill, who is at this university. And in 1992, she and uh, Jonathan Potter wrote a book called Mapping the Language of Racism. Um, it's a bit dated now, but the themes in it are still highly relevant. You still hear them in the ways New Zealanders and Australians talk about, about um, race issues. Um, OK, I'm just going to go a little bit faster because I'm concerned that I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> um, okay, so as I mentioned, the new racism um, often includes a denial of, uh, of racism. So you get the, the framing, I'm not racist, but. And I just found this little cartoon that says that nothing that starts with the words, I'm not racist, but is, is going to be followed by something good, by a positive statement. 
So the new racism is articulated through ideologies of national identity. There are a number of scholars who have made this argument. Um, the nation now is being used instead of race to legitimate oppressive uh, practices towards minorities and to sanitise racist discourses. It's much easier to talk about um, what we need as New Zealanders and New Zealand as one people uh, than it is to talk about Pākehā as one people with certain rights, for example. So, so that's, it sort of it, it sanitises um, the way that racism gets expressed. The very existence of the nation state requires exclusion. Even um, in, in, in the, there's a discussion within uh, political science and within sociology that there are a number of different ways in which we can think about the nation state. Um, and even within civic nationalism, there is a germ of ethno nationalism. I want to show you an example of that after defining these terms. So ethno nationalism is basically the assumption that members of the nation state share a heritage. So they share kind of a history, they belong together because they have a shared language, a shared culture, um, they have a, a history together, a set of traditions. Civic nationalism has been developed uh, based on the idea that in fact, um, in multicultural nations, such as New Zealand, such as Australia, you can't rely on sharing the same sort of origins. And therefore, a commitment to the political institutions of the nation state is what is required to have a sense of belonging and to actually belong to the nation state. So these are two models of, uh, of the nation state. I did some research um, looking at understandings of the nation state and understandings of national identity as part of the future fellowship that Louise mentioned. Um, these were focus groups uh, where I talked to people around Australia, 27 focus groups with around eight people um, in, in each of them. And I noticed that there was a theme that kept coming through, which is that migrants have to uh, become like Australians um, and that they can't come here and try to change our laws. Now, there's no evidence that migrants are trying to change our laws, uh, but there has been a lot of discussion in Australia around the idea of Sharia law and that some Muslims may want to um, live according to Sharia law. So we can tell that this discourse around migrants must follow the laws is actually connected to that assumption that Muslims, first of all, are migrants, whereas in fact the majority of Muslims, the, the largest group of, of Muslim, birthplace of Muslims in Australia is actually Australia. Um, and that they are trying to change our culture, they're trying to change our laws. So these are a couple of examples from, um, from one of the focus groups, um, which I read as, as, uh, as indications of the new racism. And the reason that I read them in that way is because these were given as responses to an image. So rather than asking people questions, I showed them images. And I showed them an image of the Australian values statement. This is a statement that migrants to Australia have to sign. I'm not sure whether you in New Zealand have a similar sort of thing, okay. So originally we had one that was related to citizenship. So when you become a citizen, you have to sign a statement about Australian values. But then um, in a um, political one-upmanship, uh, one of the labor leaders said, oh, well, in fact, any migrant, anyone who comes to Australia should have to sign the value statement. So the Australian value statement, I don't have an image of it here, but inc includes things like freedom of uh, um, individual dignity, freedom of religion, um, uh, the rule of law, parliamentary commitment to parliamentary democracy, equality of men and women, which I always think is an interesting one, um, egalitarianism, mutual respect, tolerance, fair play, um, compassion for those in need. Um, so these all um, appear to be you know, um, reasonable sorts of values. I think it's interesting that they're identified as Australian values. Um, these comments are made in response to a statement about values. And so immediately, rather than talking about cultural differences, people immediately go into a discussion about laws and an assumption that migrants are trying to change, uh, change our laws. There's no suggestion that Australians who don't abide by our laws ought to be deported it's simply that migrants who come here need to abide by our laws. And because they're talking about laws, we know that who they're actually talking about is Muslims. Okay? So this is the way that, this is an instance of racism, but it doesn't look anything like racism. It simply looks like somebody saying, oh, well, people who come here have to abide by our laws. <laughs> 
So you can see the ways in which that new racism new, as, as discursive, as a set of shared knowledges, this theme came up all the time in the focus groups, um, expressed by many, is evident. Um, that it's about incompatibility, that certain people are incompatible with us, that there is a hierarchy of, uh, of cultures and that ours is better and that people need to, to to, to take on our culture. Um, there's, there's a subtle sense of anger in there, um, a, a sense of fear that people are trying to change us and that they have no right to change us. Avril Bell, a scholar um, here in New Zealand, has argued that in New Zealand where this sort of discourse arises, it's because Pākehā New Zealanders realise that they have usurped the culture and the laws of the indigenous people. In Australia, we have a similar sort of thing where white Australians are kind of really wary about recognising that they have done exactly this. They've taken away the laws of the indigenous people. They've imposed their own laws. They've imposed their own culture. So I think it's fascinating and ironic that Australians kind of make this argument against newcomers. OK, so uh, flags on cars for Australia Day. Um, I just thought I'd share with you a little bit of, of this, just to kind of drive home the point about the way in which this sort of racism is connected to um, forms of nationalism. So this was some research that I did, um, I've done it twice now, um, on uh, the phenomenon which started in around 2003, 2004, reached its peak around 2007, 2008 and has since kind of died down a little bit. Australians started putting um, two flags on their cars and often four flags on their cars for Australia Day and they would do it in months leading up to Australia Day and often leave them on their cars um, afterwards. So this could mean any number of different things. You know, it could just be an expression of national pride. Yay, it's Australia Day. Let's celebrate. Um, adopted from the Americans who tend to kind of do, do that sort of thing. It could just be about marketing, that a lot of flags were being offered for free from the local hardware store or with a a crate of beer, is crate the right term, of, of, of beer, you know, that, that people would get free flags. Um, but it seemed to be more than that. There seemed to be sort of an aggressiveness about it. And, and when in, it was occurring at the same time as Cronulla riots, where people <coughs> chanting racist slogans were draping themselves in the flag, and uh, where at the Big Day Out, which is a music f festival, and the Australia Day prior to, um, uh, to, to, to me doing this research, uh, people were... Um, people who looked visibly different were being told by uh, white Australians to kiss the flag or they would be beaten up, then you can see the association between the, the flag and, and an aggressive and exclusionary, the point being exclusionary uh, form of nationalism. So anyway, so I did a survey um, of, uh, of around 513 people um, about whether they had flags on their cars for Australia Day and then looked at their attitudes about um, different minority groups. And so I'm just showing you a few of the, um, the responses here. So you can see that those who have flags on their cars um, uh, were much more likely, 15 to, to 25 percentage points more likely, to, to kind of feel more patriotic or see themselves as, as more nationalist. So that's quite a significant difference. When you do the, you know, the, the statistical test for significant dif difference, um, almost all of these came out as st significant. But what I'm more interested in are things like the fourth statement there, the white Australia policy saved Australia from a lot of problems experienced by other countries. And you've got significantly more flag flyers than non-flag flyers agreeing with that statement. Um, and yet you've got you know, the, the next statement that it's good to have people from different ethnic, religious and racial groupings living in Australia. Um, granted, there's a lower proportion of flag flyers who agree with that, but it's still a majority. Um, people who come to Australia, both groups think that they should adopt Australian uh, values, but they're not so convinced that people should leave their um, traditions, um, their old ways behind. Uh, the flag flyers were more convinced about that than the non-flag flyers. And that sense of fear that I talked about earlier, that one's culture is being, um, is under threat basically, um, something that, uh, that Lyons and colleagues have noted here in, uh, in New Zealand as well, um, that was, was quite strong among the, the flag flyers. I asked a question about how positive you feel about particular minorities. Now, this is not my methodology, okay? I don't, I don't like to use these sort of very basic, simplistic, quantitative questions where people have to tick a box. This was a five-point scale and people had to say whether they were positive or, um, 
yeah, how, how positive they felt uh, towards certain categories. And I haven't included I, in, in the slide, but I did actually have um, a question on white Australians. And the numbers for white Australians were 60% and 63%. Um, so people were quite willing to identify groups that they felt more positive about. So Indigenous Australians below half for, um, for both flag flyers and non-flag flyers. Muslims, Muslim Australians are uh, very, very low. And you can see that flag flyers um, are, are much more negative than the, um, the non-flag flyers. Asylum seekers, same, and Asian Australians, uh, similar. So you can see that there's a pattern there in terms of the people who feel more nationalistic, the people who are flying flags on their cars, and uh, negativity towards internal diversity. So that, that just sort of shows that link. Um, OK. Now, politicians kind of feed into this exclusionary nationalism to develop their support base. And uh, um, Jay made the comment as we were walking up here that maybe the talk should be renamed uh, what's new about the old racism, because it looks as though Trump may be leading in the, uh, um, the, the, the vote count, which is, which is happening as we speak. Yes, well, you may cover your face. Uh, oh, re oh, well, <laughs> I wouldn't admit that. <laughs> I'm half American, so yeah. Um, yes. Um, so, and, and the Brexit. The Brexit was also kind of based around this sort of this, this nationalist, exclusionary, um, racist sort of politics. Um, so, yeah, make 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 Britain back great again. Make uh, make America great again. Um, this is the, the sort of cry. T Tony Abbott was the Australian Prime Minister who, along with John Howard, was really keen on this sort of discourse. And he came out at one point um, telling Australian Muslims that they needed to make a choice to be on Team Australia, um, which is, again, an interesting construction. You know, Team is a, is a good, you know, Australians are into sport and so on. So um, to, um, I guess, identify all of those who are currently members of the nation state to feel as though they are members of a team and to identify those people who do not fit, who simply um, should be excluded from the nation state. So he said you have to make a choice. Um, it was a clear target um, and uh, it, it's Muslims. Uh, so he said, my position is that everyone has got to be on Team Australia. Everyone has got to put this country, its interests, its values and its people first. You don't, um, and you don't migrate to this country unless you want to join our team. Um, so that's an example of the ways in which uh, this sort of racism gets um, perpetuated by, uh, by political leaders. And I want to, at this point, kind of move on to challenges towards, um, towards this form of racism. Because I've, I've written a paper with a PhD student looking at challenges to the notion of Team Australia um, in cartoons. And Paul Spoonley has written in the New Zealand context about the ways in which the media are kind of getting a bit better about dealing with issues of representation and issues around, around uh, race and cultural difference, that they are starting to recognise the need to be more inclusive. And I think this is an example in the Australian context of um, of that happening as well. So uh, we found a number of cartoons which turned around Abbott's assumptions about Muslim Australians as not belonging to Team Australia. Um, so, yes. So some of the other examples of, of cartoons, I haven't got examples here, but uh, one of them had uh, the Muslim Australians as, as, um, as being kind of Team B. So you've got the A team, which are the white Australians, and another cartoonist had done a similar thing where you had all of the Australian, the politicians from Abbott's political party, all white in their kind of rugby jerseys and so on, and then you had all the ethnic minorities kind of on the other side trying to get onto the team. So, so they played around with, with this idea. Another one had... Um, just the caption, we used to be mates and now we're a team, which was, again, kind of an interesting comment on the fact, well, you know, we, we were never mates. Like, th these are both rhetorics. Um, so this particular cartoon I, I like. Um, that's Abbott there with the red um, budgie smugglers on his head. Do, do you, you're familiar with that, that kind of emblem of Tony Abbott? Um, he's, you, you know, Vladimir Putin, who likes to have himself photographed shirtless. Abbott is a bit of a sportsman like that, and so he likes to have himself photographed coming out of, um, 
the the water, you know, beach beach. Um, kind of surfy kind of guy um, wearing his uh, his red budgie smugglers, um, and so this cartoonist has him almost blinded by the the red budgie smugglers, um, and has juxtaposed uh, a woman in hijab, which is what raised the whole issue of Team Australia, um, and a whole bunch of other Australians who are covering their heads, covering their faces, just to make the point that yeah, you know, in fact, in Team Australia, we actually have a lot of people who may, for various reasons, cover their heads, cover their faces. And so why is it that this particular group is being excluded? So these were challenges to, um, to the sort of racism um, that I've been identifying. OK, um, other challenges. Um, did some work with, uh, with another colleague in, in psychology, looking at the, the ways in which everyday racism gets challenged. Um, there are some scholars at um, the University of Western Sydney who have identified 14 characteristics of anti, everyday anti-racism, the ways in which we can challenge racism in effective ways in our everyday lives. Um, and so Anne Peterson and I then took those, um, those 14 ways and mapped them onto a discussion that was going on in a blog about asylum seekers, because that's another of the main groups to which, towards whom um, racism is expressed in the Australian context. Um, and we found that the people who are challenging the racist arguments are using these, um, these techniques which have been identified as successful. So they were celebrating the value of cultural diversity in Australia. They were saying, let asylum seekers come here. Um, we, have, uh, we have gained, we have benefited from the diversity that we've had in this country over the last decades. Providing accurate information to dispel uh, false beliefs. And Guerin has done some research here in New Zealand showing the same sort of thing. Thing, that where people are provided with um, uh, realistic information, so for example where people are making negative comments about asylum seekers uh, and, and migrants that they come here and they don't know English and, and so on, that if you reply saying well in fact they probably know a lot of other languages and these can be of benefit to <coughs> New Zealand or that they didn't know which country they were coming through so they didn't know which language to learn and so on, that you can turn people's attitudes around. Um, so this has been, uh, Anne Peterson's work has focused on um, the attempts to dispel false beliefs and the ways in which that changes uh, people's attitudes. So anyway, we were able to map um, a, a lot of these um, characteristics on the discussion that was going on on the, um, the blog. Um, I don't want to, um, to focus on that. Um, because I, I want to, to give a note of caution, which is that we have to be careful when we are challenging racism, not to feed into the same kind of racist discourses that we want to challenge. So here's an example of an advertisement which feeds into the traditional racism. So traditional racism um, assumed that um, the brains of people of certain racial, uh, racial groups were actually smaller than uh, those of other racial groups. So black brains are smaller than white brains, basically, that, that was the assumption. And this advertisement, which is ostensibly an anti-racist advertisement, kind of, it, it ties into that, but I, I would see it as, um, as an example of, of the ways in which we can actually turn people off. We can lose the people who we want to speak to. We can lose the, the people who we want to convince and whose attitudes we want to change. Um, I prefer the sort of approach that's been used in Australia, the racism, it stops with me campaign. And I know that the Human Rights Commissioner here has um, uh, introduced a, a um, uh, it, the, our, our sto stories. That's us, that's us. Um, where people can upload their stories of their experiences of living in New Zealand, um, the experiences of racism, their challenges to racism and so on, as ways of combating and, and um, in, uh, encouraging um, recognition of the value of the diversity um, here in New Zealand. Um, the Racism It Stops With Me campaign in Australia focuses on not identifying you as a racist, but saying racism is a problem, it's all of our responsibility. It has to stop with me, regardless of whether I see myself as a racist or not. Um, here's another example of some of the ways in which attempts at um, challenges to racism can go a little bit wrong, a little bit haywire. So this is, um, I did some research looking at 
supporters of asylum seekers in New Zealand, uh, sorry, in, in um, Australia, in, in Albany, in a small country town. These are yeah, uh, women, older women, middle-aged women, who were supportive of asylum seekers. They wanted to assist asylum seekers to settle. They wanted the government to allow asylum seekers to actually have visas and to live uh, in the community. And these were the sorts of arguments they made in letters to the editor. Hazara, this is a particular um, group from uh, Afghanistan, are not aliens, they are human beings. For racist, here's some facts. Some Afghans are now born again Christians, some have Australian girlfriends, and you can play pool with some on a Saturday night and have a beer together. Another example from a member of parliament. What we're dealing here is a group of stable, law-abiding, there's that thing again, hard-working and community-minded people who have made a contribution to Albany's economic and sporting landscape. Uh, these, are, these men are hard-working battlers who study after a long day at work to learn our language, who obey our laws, there it is again, and who accept our customs. Give these honest young men a go. What do you notice about those arguments? To me, they reinforce the idea that if people don't become born-again Christians, if they don't get Australian girlfriends, if they don't learn the language, if, you can't, if they don't learn how to drink beer at the pub on a Friday night, if they don't assimilate, they don't belong here. It reinforces the idea that we need to have a homogenous nation state in order to have a successful nation state. So we need to be careful of um, that sort of thing. Um, I will skip over... Um, this particular one. There has been an argument made by some New Zealand scholars that it takes more effort, more linguistic conversational effort to challenge uh, racism than it does to express racism. And there are a number of um, scholars now who are arguing, well, no, you can actually use the same sorts of discursive tools to challenge, to challenge racism. You just have to be careful how you do it. So finally, um, what are the implications um, of what I've been arguing? Basically, there's a continuum between the old racism and the new racism. Scr scratch the surface of the new racism a little bit and you often get back to, to the old biological kind of version. Um, we need to challenge both older concepts of racism, but also presumptions about culture and about the nation. We need to consider whether the model of the nation as inclusive um, is, is actually what's going to, to move us past this version of the new, the new racism. Um, so I, I would argue that there are challenges in promoting nationalism because you may end up with the sort of, of discourse that the Albany advocates uh, were generating, um, that people should be allowed to come here as long as they fit in with us. Um, are there ways in which we can generate a sense of ourselves as a nation state, as members of a nation state, that values the diversity um, that allows people to retain aspects of their culture, that indeed learns from the cultures of people who, um, who come to New Zealand and make, make New Zealand a home. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks. <laughs>